So Hannah, you put together a film called From Women to Men and it's gone pretty viral online. It's had, we think, over about a million views. Lots of polarised reactions. And you're, as you say in the film, what you want is to start a new conversation between women and men. And in the film, it's a, you and a, a lot of other women, including Elan, mm. owning parts of themselves that they're not, they're not proud of, the female shadow, and it's created a really polarised reaction. But as, as you say in the film, you want to start a new conversation between women and men. So hopefully we can start that happening now. But I'd love to hear a bit more about your background and what you hope to achieve through the film, what, what you want that conversation to look like. So I'm, I'm working in conflict resolution since more than 10 years and mediating huge conflicts on various levels. It's always the experience is always that our concepts we are so used to thinking of either I'm right or you are right, either I'm the victim or I'm the perpetrator, either I'm wrong or you're wrong, either it's my fault or it's your fault, that they're never true and that they're never leading anywhere. I just realized that it's as true, what is true for any, every conflict is just true for the wounding between man and women and in the gender war as well. And I'm really dreaming of a new step and a new dialogue. At the cultural level, it feels like we're in a really dysfunctional relationship between men and women. And that, I guess, is what, where the, the, the film came from and also what we're trying to achieve through this dialogue as well. So to me, it's very interesting to analyze the wound between men and women, because I think I had some special insights in two years of prostitution um, 10 years ago in my life. And when I started writing a book about it, like just uh, one year ago, I realized I'm not the victim and I'm not the aggressor. I'm both roles as a prostitute. And I think prostitute is mainly seen as the victim and the client of prostitute is mainly seen as the aggressor. And when I started writing about the client's sexuality as I remember it, I felt, oh my God, they are not the aggressors. They are not the winners and no client on earth feels like a winner. They are suffer they're suffering so deeply and are helpless and overwhelmed and like also victims. And I think by writing this, I somehow surprised myself. And then Hannah wrote to me an email because she read this book when I think your script just, just came out of your inspiration. And I think then we had these parallels and felt this is a new aspect or dynamics between the sexes that is as needed as Me Too. And then I think due to this book and the parallel to the film, we got close with each other very soon. And I was reading the script and feeling, whoa, after all the challenging stuff that I'd written, this is really challenging and this is really taboo. And then I needed time to digest. And also I had an immediate, immediate yes. At the same time, I didn't want to push myself over my limits because I felt it's not about my shadow is gone when I participate in the film. It's, whoa, I'm more deeply connected with my shadow. It's still there. And so I, I, was, I was happy about the time between getting to know the script and participating in the film because it was already a huge healing journey for me. And it went on after the film. I'm so, so grateful and touched by this invitation, I think, because it really opens another aspect of an interesting and lively dialogue instead of something where we have to say, are we the good ones or the bad ones? And it seems as if um, collectively, I don't know, some, something is ready that things show up you now. And in the Me Too, we can see that really the female wounding has shown up. I said, look what happens. We've talked about this, obviously, quite a few times before. And what I'm really fascinated about is that your, your background seems to kind of mirror a lot of the dynamics that we're seeing now. That it kind of goes back to the 70s, the first kind of, move, the first kind of eruption of the women's movement. Um, I'll let you kind of tell the story, but it's a really interesting kind of life story and experience. I come from a different generation. I was living in Berkeley and Berkeley was also simultaneously going through the very first first um, appearance of a really strong women's movement 
was probably the place where it was coming forth the strongest and that was really challenging you know also like because I never thought about objectifying women or any of the things that was just how it was you know and then suddenly there was like thousands of women in Berkeley who were coming together and feeling very angry and I was just lost with the whole thing but fortunately there was also the kind of cutting edge of new therapies and inner work that was happening and out of desperation and necessity I found myself in my very first group which happened to be a men's group a men's encounter bioenergetic group and within about 20 minutes the guys had tossed me into the middle of the room and started provoking me because I had no access to my anger and that was what was driving me crazy and I got involved with living together with a group of men who identified themselves we identified ourselves as feminists it was, we were so, we, and we created a men's center and we had a men's radio talk show to talk about men's issues but, and they were all in response to the challenges that were coming from the feminists and basically, literally, we were caught with our pants down feeling very guilty um, and apologetic and castrated like we're wrong and I remember one day in a, in a meeting, just not connecting with the words everybody was saying and having this kind of almost like out of body experience in a way where I felt like I could just see all of us men and I had this vision that we were all sitting there sawing off our balls. And I was like shocked by it and I was like, and I realized in that moment that it wasn't going to, it wasn't going to free me, you know, and I, about after seeing that... Nor about, the women. Pardon? Nor the women. Nor the women, that it wasn't the answer, and I didn't feel, all of a sudden I felt separate from that group that I had felt very connected to. And uh, about 15 minutes later, I stood up and resigned from the group, and I just said, there's something going on here, and I didn't name it as castration. I didn't understand that really even at that time. I didn't name it as guilt, but I saw it as guilt and I saw it being turned, everybody was turning against themselves, we're so wrong, we're so bad. And uh, I got up and I walked out and I went out to dinner with my mother. <laughs> and I became so interested in this subject of the healing of, ma of the masculine and the healing of the feminine that I became a therapist and it became one of the main subjects that I specialized in and I still lead workshops and trainings with that and it's a, so it's a work that I have a big passion for and even so after all those years your words were like something I hadn't heard before or even allowed myself to actually conceive of so it was also a kind of waking up moment for me and and then with me too coming out and feeling that anger coming out and having my own history of realizing how my empowerment came by really getting in touch with my anger and letting it come out there was a big bravo yes you know about it you know and um, at the same time I think that the the, the we need to come out of the blame culture, you know, and we need to come into the responsible culture. And just a little bit of time that we've spent together and the way that we've been talking and everything just feels like, yes, this is the con The real conversation between men and women hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I just hope that as part of our learning, we're, we're learning from each other as we talk and that we're still in that and I don't want to um, posture myself as somebody who has all the answers, I don't, it's still, it's still a process of revelation and learning. It's so interesting, I just need to <laughs> catch that ball. I need to stop the blaming and when I was listening to your story I immediately thought yes and also the safe blaming. <laughs> 
we need to stop the blaming over there and also the safe self-blaming and in your story you shared how what you've been experiencing in these man groups <laughs> group back then was not so much okay we take responsibility for our shadow it was self-blaming and going into guilt and mm -hmm. that's what we women mm -hmm. can do very well as well it's all our fault <laughs> <laughs> and i know that some Thanks. women out there who have seen the film are afraid that that's what we, mm -hmm. we were doing another mm -hmm. round of self-blaming okay now it's not blaming now it's mm -hmm. self-blaming and it's not it's we don't not have a all. culture of saying sorry for what happened Without. out of a place of greatness yes. we always yeah. learn how to apologize from a place of smallness and small people won't save the earth they won't be happy mm -hmm. they won't mm -hmm. contribute to anything i have to have this incredible courage of loving myself with all those shadows yeah yeah, and it's when we stop out of this thing of guilt and fault mm -hmm. <laughs> and go into just taking responsibility that I start to be curious about the conversation. Yeah. It's interesting, there's a, there was a big um, phrase that became quite popular in the 60s through, the, through the, the women's movement was the personal is political. And what's really interesting is your film is very personal, very, very personal, but it's also putting a finger on one of the kind of the real um, source points on the culture, um, especially coming so soon after Me Too, the sight of kind of so many women owning their stuff. Um, even I, I have to admit, when I watched the film, or when I watched the poem first time that you delivered it, I was immensely touched by it, and I have felt touched by it when I've watched it. But I've also watched it and felt, wow, this is so um, countercultural, for want of a better word. It's so opposite to the narrative that, that, that we're in as a culture right now, that I've, that I've also felt, wow, it's unbalanced. And I do feel that it's unbalanced in some way because it has to be matched by a similar ownership from the other side. Certain parts of the media, I would say at the moment, are very, have a very ideological perspective, a very sort of feminist ideological perspective. And online, there is a kind of growing anti-feminist movement. I know sort of on, you saw with some of the comments on YouTube especially, and there is a growing kind of, they call the manosphere online. And there's a sense of any, any sign of men kind of owning their stuff is seen as apologetic. It's seen as, and it can be kind of, if it's done from a place of guilt, it can be this sort of self-castration. It can be this kind of self-negation. And I think what's interesting is, can you have ownership of how we are contributing to the division between men and women without slipping into self-hatred, without slipping into castration, without slipping into apologetic. Um, and I think that's something that I find, yeah, that, that rebalances the, the film, kind of the ownership of, of, of our stuff as men. I think it is very possible. I think rather than, you know, um going to guilt it can be self-revelation and revelation expands you and makes you happy and and as you pointed out in your thing it is empowering it is. you know it's like my shadow will play out negatively as long as i try and keep it in the closet and it will distort my life it will bring unhappiness to me and it will bring unhappiness to the people around me and it will perpetuate the, the need then to blame other people for the consequences of the ways that it played out so to me it's a very obvious truth it's still a difficult one because the shadow is in the shadow it means it's hidden it means it's not apparent it's not totally obvious you know, and I don't know if when it ends, you know, and when the when the self discovery process ends. But you know, um, it's it's been with me for quite a while that understanding that I need to own my things, and I certainly lived out uh, a sh with women things which I feel shame for and I feel apology for, but I have an understanding about right now and a compassion towards myself. I didn't get taught. I didn't learn how to be with women. I didn't learn how to be, what, what, how to deal with this strong sexuality that I had. I didn't, and, so, and I grew out of a culture that did objectify women. And I came into certain positions of, of power where it was very, where I was, um, desirable man and I could have 
the women that I wanted. And there were times when, you know, I abused that. I, I lied, I minimized, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't, I, I, on one hand, I've been like this kind of responsible, kind of growth aware guy and everything, but it did, so I can cover myself kind of like politically, spiritually correct, but I can still tell a story in a certain way that indicates more availability mm -hmm. than I actually had. And I've seen myself do that a lot of times because I wanted to go to bed with somebody. And, it, and, and so, but I said all the right things, you know, but I didn't, you know, and there was still a taking advantage of in some way. And it, and it hurt people and I've, and you know, and I, and I, I try and it, 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 it's, it's almost like my brain is conditioned in a certain way to try to get what I want and to tell the story that I think will work the best to get what I want. And sometimes it comes out of my mouth in a way that's not really totally straight. And, you know, so that, that lying to women with an, and in some relationship to sex, having sex, telling what happened to a partner when I come back, the, the, the changing of that, it's been part of my character for a long time and it's something I just have to continue to own. And every time I do, it's such a relaxation because the lie doesn't really create contact, the real contact that I want. There's always a sensing somewhere that something's a little bit off and when I just come clean with it, you know, you know what, I have to tell you something, I was lying. This is the truth this is what I did, or this is what I thought, or this was my intention. Everybody relaxes in the truth, and everybody stays a little suspicious and pulled back in the lie. And, um, you know, I like to think and be able to look straight into that camera over there and say, I have finished with that story, and I can't. That would be a lie. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know that I am, you know, I might have, my lust might overwhelm me at some moment and I might use very sophisticated seduction skills that I have to, you know, lure somebody in for my gratification, knowing full well that I don't, I'm not going to be with that person. And what I love so much, besides many aspects of your story, is it takes so much time, so many centuries. So men who want to learn how to clear their stuff, really clear it. And I think they have this ambition of, I want to be really a cleaned up guy and that's so great. Okay, then you deserve a few centuries of studying it every day of your life. And you know what? It's not the women who are worth it, who are going to sleep with. You are worth it. Yeah. You are doing it for yourself. Yeah. And I think this is a very big key that especially men in our fast food culture don't learn. They deserve time for learning because this is deep stuff. It's not something that they can buy. It's not something that anybody learned to perform in. And it's not their guilt that they have to unravel the stuff. And I think then, and this is when you said like a few minutes before, I want to apologize and it reached me. What me reached is something so touching because I experienced it so, so little from men in our days. They say sorry and they don't need me. They don't need my reaction. They are with themselves. They are with their balls. They are with their boundaries. Mm -hmm. They are not something that I can fall into with you as sorry so I can get what I want. It touches me so deeply. And this is not because you learned it yesterday, but because you started studying it 40 years ago. And I just want to say thank you for that, because what I experience in my nervous system, and I would add to personal is political, personal is collective. What I experience is something that really matters to me. And I think this is something that I might say to many women in the collective field. Thank you. Something more that I could feel I could feel the relaxation in my nervous system when you were just saying that's the truth. And in allowing yourself to say, I cannot say into the camera, that is all healed now, I'm clean now. I'm continuously doing this work and owning and trying to be as honest as I can, gives me the allowance to 
be allowed to learn too. And I want to learn to be more and more and more clear with my truth and my boundaries instead of going into the seduction and manipulation games we have learned and I cannot promise that I will do in every moment and I will not step back into it in moments and thus I do understand man's mistrust. I do understand that it's not easy to trust as women. I do understand and I even can't say me, honestly me, you can trust yeah. always. <laughs> I can't. Yeah. I can't. Sometimes I can't even trust myself. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge that it's part of a learning curve and you can't see further ahead of the learning curve than where you are right now, but that you recognize the history of it and that who knows what the next challenges are going to be. One thing I definitely realize is that in the moment where we just decide and commit both to wanting to learn, owning that we make mistakes, that we fall back, mm. and that we are curious about finding out what it is, what, what is acting out, what are we doing. When I feel that both sides are curious about it, then I, 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 yeah. I start to become really alive and really interested. Yeah. And really interested in the relation and really interested in the dialogue and the conversation. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting um, comparing to to you, like we're from different generations. Yes. And I was raised by a very feminist family, by a feminist mother, a feminist father. Um, and my, I think the way that, that, that I've behaved in relationships um, has been much more holding myself back and the lying has been a kind of lie of, of, of omission a lot of the time. It's been not fully showing up, not fully telling the truth, not kind of taking on this kind of feeling of I'm completely responsible for the way that um, my partner feels. So not being honest about the way I was feeling and stringing, stringing women along, of kind of internalizing this, this feeling of I'm completely responsible for everything that they feel and then not really being honest and being in relationships for longer than I should be and not being honest about what I'm feeling. So when I look at the Me Too movement and that it's a lot of kind of men the moment it's like men acting out and being um, sexually predatory, I didn't experience that. I don't think that was my stuff. And I don't think that's a lot of guys from, from my generation's stuff. I think a lot of them were actually brought up in a different environment. And a lot of it was feeling a sense of shame around themselves as men and not fully showing up for that reason. At least that is something that I have started to experience. Um, and in my work with my clients, etc., etc., that um, as I said in the beginning, in the moment where I started to be interested in my shadow and where I started to feel more empowered and more loving towards myself, I started to feel really compassion for the role. I could see, wow, it has to be difficult to grow up as a boy and, a, and to become a man nowadays. Because the narrative of Men are perpetrators, men are violators, men are abusers is so huge and out of good reasons of course, it's the, this does not come out of nothing but no man is born as a abuser and of an aggressor and as, as and a problem at all. <laughs> it's a biological problem. So yes. And you get born and you grow up with these images of manhood. And I, and I think this is something that Rafia talks about really well, that if as a man you grow up feeling that, you then suppress a lot of the kind of the natural aggression or the natural kind of feelings. You, you, don't, you, you very much don't want to be like those other guys. And actually that leads to a sort of... Um, Self-castration. Mm. Mm -hmm. And, I and see male shadow of that. perverted aggression. So when we hear the word aggression and male aggression, we, we think about men taking their gun or taking their penis and raping a woman. And I think these are perverted um, expressions of an aggression that the men had to suppress before it got into this form. So even our language is very, 
it's, it's very subtle. What, what we are looking for in the first place is an instinctual anger of protecting boundaries and that's for the sake of peace and not for the sake of war between the sexes. So. Yeah, and that's so interesting the way you say that because what I work with a lot of times with men is that they, they have rejected a side of their own masculinity like the roots of their masculine because they want to be like anything but like all those guys who they see as responsible for the problems and so they and and they think that that's a, a level of aggression and violence and sexual abuse and so they repress that side and of course then it gets acted out it comes out in all kinds of things and a lot of times what i'm doing in groups with men is getting men to go in and really feel that layer of the masculine where there is a level of aggression and frustration and anger and hatred and encourage them to just allow it to come out and rather than that overwhelming their personality like they're afraid and them becoming that way they find that it's actually not that much it's like it's a layer but as long as you deny that layer you know, you, you lose your roots and you lose your instinctive connection to masculinity and to, and to the truth that you could express in your sexuality, you know. And so that's a big part of like the men's work I do is to get men to go into that. It's how culture creates the specific male shadow of aggression and it's like every shadow. The thing is this and it's healthy and it's good, but a shadow is a monster. And then you say, you want me touching this monster? No way. Yes. And you say, honey, trust me, I'm doing this for 40 years. It's worth it every time I do it. And then you say, hey, come on. And I, see, I think every, also with female rage, I think this is not that big difference. Whenever I go really into rage and really into anger and stay with my body, I find myself to be the most peaceful being Life. on earth. <laughs> the last thing that I planned, I just planned to somehow survive this wave of rage. And then, wow, I'm okay, you are okay. <laughs> That's, it's quite a shock how positive it is to, to discharge suppressed aggression. Because this, this thing about the repressed or the repressed aggression, which then, as any, any shadow does, then plays out, I think is actually the unspoken dynamic behind a lot of the Me Too stuff that we've seen. Because a lot, it's come out that a lot of the people who were accused of um, acting out in ways during Me Too identified themselves as male feminists. They identified themselves as not those kind of guys. And if you identify yourself as I'm not that kind of guy, then you're suppressing this thing and it comes out sideways. And I think this is, this is part of, on a cultural level, I think unless we realize this, that actually we need to encourage men to embrace their masculinity, to live that out, to be in, in a full way, then they are discharging it. They're not pushing it down into the cellar and then it comes out sideways. And I think as a culture, we're, we're actually probably going to encourage more of that kind of stuff because we're teaching men to be ashamed of their sexuality. We're teaching men to be ashamed of their masculine aggression. I think that's actually going to have the, the, the reverse effect to the one that we think. And, but, and I want to add that when a group of men go through that, and it's something I would try and bring in rather early in a men's group, they come into a relaxation and, like you said, a peacefulness. And, uh, and this thing of male bonding becomes very real, a support for each other and a love and a kindness and a... And, uh, and almost a cessation of a certain kind of competition that is there when somebody feels castrated or when somebody feels not empowered, then they're always having to prove themselves and they come in as brothers and support. And that's one of the most beautiful things that happens in men's group. It, it isn't that they arrive, okay, this is home and I'm a, I'm a beast, I'm a rapist, I'm a killer, I'm a thing. It's quite the opposite. They go, Oh God, I feel so good, and I love being a man. And this, or, and they can feel their legs, and they can feel their balls, and they can feel that kind of connection. And it's a kind of simple healing, in fact, of a, of a tremendous amount of what's been absorbed from the culture, which is making masculinity so toxic. And and I want to say that it that it's also right 
to really challenge masculinity and the way that it acts out. The way that it acts out when this, when a man is castrated, and when he hasn't owned this part of himself, he really is a bit of a monster. And I think the big misunderstanding collectively is um, that we mistake this expression of distorted, castrated masculinity as masculinity. Mm -hmm. So many, when I listen to many feminist women, um, not all of them, of course, but many, it sounds as if that was the essence of masculinity and thus we have to fight it. And this is a huge misunderstanding because this is not natural masculinity. Yeah. This yeah. is already coming out of this castration of losing access to natural masculinity sure. and also same as for, for as yes, women, for women. To, to, to a natural power. I think both femininity, I was so turned off of being a woman when I thought what this culture offers me as typical feminine, it's, it's the loser card. Who, who should want to have tits? Nobody on earth. It's just <laughs> being, being the secondary class of human beings. And so when I started to question, is this right? Or am I right and have every right on earth to unravel my kind of femininity? I became curious and I think this is so important for men too. They want to gain back their masculine essence. Mm -hmm. And so they have to be curious about what comes up in themselves when they allow to set boundaries to this conditioning or this cultural imprint what masculinity means. Mm -hmm. So we, it's almost like we need two words. We need, um, are we talking about this masculinity yeah. or the true masculinity? Well, boy psychology and man psychology, a lot of people yeah. divide it okay, into that. Okay. Yeah, so a lot of what people are, yeah, are protesting against or attacking is boy psychology yeah. rather than yeah. man psychology. It's not fully... Yeah. 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 That but but it goes into this but direction. And in both cases, I think like a real rite of passage at the time of life when we're coming into puberty, where you're welcomed into the feminine and into womanhood and your the secrets and mysteries of it are revealed to you by elder women and the same for men. My life would have been so different, God, if I had had that, if I had gotten the teaching in that way of what, it, what does it mean and I felt included and I felt the support. I felt like a group of men or just even my father, you know, had my back and were there for me. You know, it would have changed everything. You know, I just, I, I was so, I, really, the amount of suffering and, uh, and pain and, and loss alone with it. and being alone with it and just completely confused. I would like to come back to what you have been sharing because I think it's really interesting you have been sharing that your personal experience is quite different in a different generation. There's not been as much conditioning, let's say, of um, women are objects has more been you have to care for women, for women's emotion, for you are responsible or let's say guilty when a woman feels bad, this kind of stuff. And I imagine that this brings along a lot of holding back of own needs, wishes, whatever, truth. <laughs> and that this can bring a lot of rage too. I'm, I'm curious, I'm curious to hear about you, is there um, rage about that and is there what, what is your experience with that what well like yeah I don't know how much of that is particular to my upbringing because my mother was um, often depressed and I think a lot of children take on if they have a depressed parent that it's their fault so a lot of that could be tied in with it as well um, but I also know from the inner work that I've done and I know you've done a lot of inner work as well if you dig down it's almost universal that you have some kind of anger towards your parents. You are in this kind of very, you, you, you pretty much, you, all of your emotions you, you kind of put onto your parents. They were the world and they never, they were, they were there, they weren't there. And when they weren't there, we all have this kind of infantile rage that I think we all have on some level inside us. And I think getting that out in some way is kind of an essential part of, of getting more healthy as, a, as an adult. Um, but also going into that kind of inner work, what I found really interesting was how much more difficult it is to identify the mother stuff than it is to identify the father stuff. Like often, and I've seen it with other people in these kind of processes as well, it's, it's, it's quite easy sometimes to see 
well, my father did this, my father did that, he was there, he wasn't there, he was an alcoholic, he was whatever. And you can kind of quite easily identify it and it seems much more easy to process. Whereas the mother stuff, I found far more difficult to see and far more difficult to clear because a lot of the time it comes with these sort of feelings of, well, it would be so wrong to feel angry towards your mother. It would be so bad to feel that towards your mother. And I've, I've seen, yeah, I've, certainly for myself, I found it much more difficult to see it, identify it, and then to kind of work with it than with the father stuff. You just touched something, though, that I think for myself personally, and I see it with other men, ties the story of the, the mother and the lack of power in the men together. And that has been the, um, this feeling that you become very, very sensitive to your mother's feelings and the changes of mood and whatever's happening in the house. And um, it creates a kind of pleaser mentality in a way that's trying to damage control women. And I've noticed in my relationships, I carry that sensitivity. It's like my mother was mostly really quite a bright and happy person, but when she would go, you'd feel the air change, you know, and there's something going on. And then I, I see myself getting activated in a way that I become a pleaser. It's then what can I do in order, and underneath it I'm trying to change her. I'm trying to damage control the, the emotional woman, you know, and, and what it brings out, and I, I know it from my own experience and I see it in other things, it brings out the contempt of the woman because the women hate, because I become regress into a boy in that moment. I'm, I'm afraid, basically, of the feminine feelings and that maybe some kind of negativity is going to come out. And so I start trying to find out what's wrong or make things right or please or go to my mind and try and talk to her, talk some sense into her, and damage control the whole thing. But it's all motivated for, by, by my discomfort of that situation. And it's a, it's a real challenge for me, even today, if I feel that my woman is going through something and to let her be. You know, and, and not come in with, oh, can I, you know, start doing nice things for her or, or um, trying to talk her out of her feelings. How can I fix it? Yeah, how can I fix it? Trying to fix a woman, yeah. you know, and, and, it, and it's a sure thing to bring out the woman's sword that wants to, yeah. you know, whack my balls off, yeah. you know, because they, I think, because I don't think a woman wants a boy. And so to really investigate that whole part, you know, of um, the fear of women's emotions mm -hmm. and the fear and, and risk mm -hmm. a woman's rejection mm -hmm. and anger mm -hmm. is a big step in growing up to being a man. Mm -hmm. And, I, and it's, a, it's a scary one to risk the woman's anger you know, um, and rejection. Mm -hmm. And if, if we don't, we become pleasers. Mm -hmm. And we're not really present we, then as we men, and we're not really there, mm -hmm. and then, and then... We start mm -hmm. to devalue and to depreciate. Totally, yeah. totally. And it's, the yeah. right, it's the, and it's the right, yeah, you can manipulate it, and you can castrate, mm -hmm. and reject. Yeah. And usually, once you castrate it, you usually will we do both. in order to go to the hot guys. Usually we do yeah. both. It's really... Yeah. Usually yeah. we do both. Mm -hmm. First we man manipulate it and then we get straight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's a real, and that, that's part of the complexity of the relationship with the mother. Because the mother was holding the basic energy of the house. And yeah. of course, I want to be in the loving, happy, merged, relaxed space. And when all of a sudden the, the vibe in the house starts to get tense and the chill comes in, and then I know something bad is going to happen. I know a fight's going to erupt between my mother and my father. Maybe my father's late coming home from work, which means he stopped off to have a drink, which means my mom is, is really activated and it's going to be a fight. Then I'm on alert. My whole nervous system is, is on alert then, and I'm trying to damage control it. And I've lost myself. 
you know, and it was a very real fear as a kid, but I somehow to confront that place as a man mm -hmm. and see it and then say what I really feel, you know, instead of trying to manipulate, because that's where the ma manipulation goes in and just come out so and ask know. really straight, hey, what's going on right now? You know, and be there and be present and grounded in, in, in the masculine and recognize that something's happening and not be in trying to fix it or be in judgment of it, but be actually really curious. There's that word curious again. I'm really curious what's going on right now. And it's so interesting, for me it's so interesting to hear and to realize how this having learned that somehow manipulate the situation and the other person is the only way to <laughs> damage control or to is mutual is because we as girls mm -hmm. have learned that mm -hmm. from our mother too maybe slightly different reasons i can speak for myself and i know this is true for many women i know that we have not learned from our mothers that a girl and a woman can have your boundaries and say what she thinks and what she means and say no and stand up for what is right for me. I have not learned that I had no role model for that. Yeah. It's always no, trying to make it right for everyone else and in order to get it at least a little bit right for yourself mm -hmm. to manipulate. and. It's trying always to trying to find safety by going to the outer world. And that's always the wrong first step. Yeah. I have to be safe with myself. And I think this is also an insight where it's like, it's really 10 deaths at the same time. It's like somebody asks me, what do you feel? And I try to channel, what does he want to hear? <laughs> how sick is that? <laughs> but how normal? Yeah. How collective? How deeply am I not in touch with myself? <laughs> so I'm not out of touch with myself when my woman gets, yeah. woman gets grumpy. I'm out of touch with myself like all the time. So this is something of where we, where we really, I think, get humble and wise around how deep the wounding is yeah. and how big the gifts are that we can get on this way. Because yes. what I notice is that if I don't lose my ground and I don't go into the pleasing boy and I don't go into the damage controlling thing and I stay grounded in myself and I ask from a grounded place, hey, what's going on? I find women generally will go to, to sense that safety from the grounded masculine and they'll go and they'll share very honestly mm -hmm. and, then and they'll tell me easy instead of complicated yeah no and it's really becomes a, and it's an easy conversation and then rather than have a long complicated kind of thing that swims in the morassy swampy territory for a few days it's over in a couple minutes mm -hmm. And again, I feel in the kind of you asking what's going on that I won't be able to get you with my manipulation. Exactly. So I can stop my drama queen behavior right at this moment. And to be honest, it's a relief. It's a relief. But I don't get this exit normally because you always say, what's going on? Like, honey, yeah. can I be a better person? And then you stop oh. crying. And so it's, it's so interesting around men with healthy boundaries. It's, it's a highway to collect a feeling. It's, yeah. the, it's the paradoxes that... Yeah by saying it's only when you're prepared to say something that might uh, make someone dislike you or make a yeah. woman dislike you, make a woman reject you, yeah. that you actually become safe enough to trust. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. it's, it's yeah. as you've said, it's, it's the growing up from a boy to a man, being prepared to say something that may make a woman reject you. And to... being grounded enough to be able to receive not happy reactions in the first place. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think even rejection, rejected of being the, um, the fear of being rejection from the woman is a fear of death because it's your mother rejecting you. I think rejection in itself isn't dangerous enough. I think it's, it's not something, like, oh, I'm not loved, but I'm threatened to death. I think there's it's something. It's also, to, in some an sense, existential threat. it is an existential thing. Yeah. You really take it way, way back. Yeah. 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 It manifests as, as like, rejection or yeah. I'm the yeah. cause so of that maybe I'm the cause of it or and then you enter into mm. a very complex relationship with the feminine in that whole thing whereas you as I said a minute ago and you confirmed it's actually very simple but also from an evolutionary level it's that women hold the key for men men's um, genes to go into the next generation so being rejected by a woman is being rejected mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. life existence. by existence yeah. Yeah. and on some level I think that's that's absolutely true. I think that's the level of 
that's the level of existential terror that a lot of men have asking women out. Um, that in some sense they're standing in for the world, they're standing in for nature, they're standing in for existence itself. Yeah. So it's not just a male ego thing, it's really an, an urgent instinctual threat mm. of yes or no, life or death. Mm. I want to, there's something else that struck me recently um, as I was thinking about your film, Hannah, is that, and you also saw this with some of the reactions to it, there was quite a few, um, especially on YouTube, there were some reactions from guys um, who I'd say sort of mugtail, men going their own way, or men's rights activists, saying, too late ladies, um, you, you won't trick us again, all of this really sort of toxic, um, pretty misogynistic um, comments. And there are, online, there are quite a lot of places that where um, talk about women degenerates into this very sort of toxic or very misogynistic, very, very suspicious, very misogynistic um, place. And what I found really interesting when I was thinking about your film is that because there is very little discussion of the female shadow in culture, the only place that I think a lot of guys who've maybe been hurt in relationships find it is on these websites. So suddenly the only place that you ever hear anyone talking about, well, women are, women can be manipulative, women can be bitches, women can, be like, can behave badly. If the only place that people find it is on these websites, then what I think will happen is that people will then get more and more radicalized because on this website, it's not that women can behave like this, it's women always behave like this. Women always will ditch you for a more, uh, more attractive man, they will, you can't trust what they say. There's all of these kind of really, um, yeah, and it feels like you expressing, both of you expressing the, the, the fact of the female shadow and bringing that somehow more into the conversation is really essential to, to because otherwise the only place that you can find it is where the, where the conversation goes toxic. And making that conversation much more mainstream, I think, is essential, really essential, to, to, to try and, because otherwise it's, it's really unbalanced. Yes, and I was really surprised to, honestly, I discovered this men's rights movement and men going their own way. Thanks to the film and the reactions to the film, I didn't know anything about it. I had learned a lot about men's wounding. I had started to see how difficult it is also to grow up as a man in this society and in this world. But I didn't know that there could be... And, of course, I knew about um, devaluation of women by men, but that there can be so much hurt and hate against women as you find it on these websites. I didn't even know, I was not aware of, and it's shocking. <laughs> In some way it's really shocking, but it's also touching because it, it shows how deep the wounding is. And something that stroked me is that I, I start to see a parallel. <laughs> um, and a parallel between where feminism has partly gone, um, where Me Too has partly gone, means turned into something toxic, turned instead of standing up for our rights and our boundaries, starting to fight all men collectively, sitting in we are the victims, we are the poor ones and you are all, <laughs> all the bad ones. And it struck me to see that these men who write in that way in these um, internet pages etc. are doing exactly the same. They're saying, we men are the victims and all women are evil and now we have to fight the women. Instead of standing up and saying, stop, here I have a clear boundary because not all men are evil. <laughs> and uh, we have our wounds, we have experience, we have had a lot of bad experiences. That is great. But, but this going into a victim's hole and pointing the finger and fighting collectively the other sex, I can see it on both sides and it's not going anywhere. If so this Patrick's would work, it would have worked already. <laughs> yes, it's really yes. like yes. flipping it around, it just yes. changes yes. the color of the same problem. We won't get yes. anywhere with the same metrics, with the same thinking. And yet, and so, but it's also true for both sides that I yeah. see the pain where it comes from. I see, I've mm -hmm. seen it for women first, to be honest. <laughs> um, but I see it there now too and I see 
many things they have gone through and I'm, I'm happy what you have uh, pointed out that yes that this film might be one contribution I hope it's just the beginning of a new conversation um, a beginning of a contribution to offering space for having these conversations in a more mature way <laughs> and in a more constructive way and I am actually touched by quite some feedbacks I get from men who have experienced very badly, ba have very bad experiences. Many wrote about their experience in divorce, not being allowed to see their kids, mm -hmm. having been, well, even also I, I, I received letters of men saying I have been not, not even only emotionally but also physically abused in my marriage. I have stayed because I have two wonderful kids. I have a lot of heavy experiences and I guess that the man going into these movements, man going their own way, many of them have these experiences and have never found a place to express their hurt. And I'm, I'm really touched and happy that thanks to this film, men show up and write about these experiences without hatred but with, with hope. They wrote, thank you so much, I hope again that women maybe can even love me as a man. I, I, I read this line, it's touching, yeah. it's, wow. And I, that's my hope for this film and the subsequent work and the work that's happening out of Rebel Wisdom is that it will encourage healing and offer possibilities other than blame and victimhood. And without judgment towards the people who've taken these very strong positions because we don't know what happened to them. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they formed their personalities the way that they did and they came to these beliefs out of real experiences. And so there has to be a, a certain level of compassion, but just to even get the possibility that it's possible to have open, honest conversations where people own their shadow side, I know from my work with people is really a route towards healing. Mm -hmm. Now, how quickly that is taken up or how broadly yeah. that is embraced and remains to be seen, yeah. you know, but I, 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 that's why I respect so much the work that you're doing right now and going around and talking to all these people who I think really do mm. want the healing to happen yes. and really do I want a real... I mean, how much richer would our lives be if we really yes. can open up and talk and share and be and how much more joyful and I mean, it's mm. just so obvious. I want to repeat what you have been saying in the beginning. Um, I would love to invite everyone to start to, to, to do these steps and not for the others. Mm -hmm. Me as a woman, I am not doing it for you. <laughs> I'm really doing it for myself. And you should do it for yourself and not for us. Mm -hmm. Because it's so freeing. It is stepping out of a victim's place is the best thing I could ever have done for myself. Yeah. That's the truth. Yeah. And my truth is my heart wants to love. And if I stay in the victim's place, stay in the blaming place, I don't allow my heart to love and I suffer from it. Maybe you too, but in the first place, me. I yeah. suffer from it.